Coming up, the story behind one of the greatest songs ever. The co-writer, a legendary guitarist, tells us the story, and it's pretty unbelievable. First off, the song was turned out by Tom Petty, and then it was offered to a different Rock and Roll Hall of Famer who put lyrics to it, and he said it was the best song that he'd written in 10 years, or maybe ever. And then on separate occasions, two freak accidents almost stopped it from being recorded altogether. And then when it finally came out, the song was so powerful, its iconic singer nearly wrecked his Porsche when it came on the radio. This is a story you truly cannot miss with a true legend next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you spent more on your car stereo than your actual car growing up, you're going to dig this channel. Make sure that you subscribe below right now to be a part of this music community. Click the bell so that you always know when our latest interviews come out. Uh, we also want to invite you to our upcoming event, Professor of Rock Live. This is a live event with a legend performing their greatest songs and telling their stories. And you can get tickets at the link below. Now, we also have a Patreon. You're going to want to check that out has even more content. You can be an honorary producer as well and help us keep this music alive. So it's time for another edition of our series, Revelations. This is where artists give us exclusive behind the scenes experiences about their biggest songs and their greatest albums. It's insight that you really won't find anywhere else. And today I tell you, we have something really special for you. I was extremely fortunate to sit down for an in-depth interview with Rock and Roll Hall of Famer co-writer, producer, and guitarist with Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, the great Mike Campbell. I've been waiting to do this interview for a long time. We discussed his new full-length album, Mike Campbell and the Dirty Knobs, called External Combustion, which is amazing. And he also shared stories behind his greatest songs, including today's feature. After the Eagles broke up in 1980, Don Hanley went solo. He released I Can't Stand Still in late 1981, was pushed forward by his brilliant hit, Dirty Laundry. As he prepared to release his second album, Building the Perfect Beast, he collaborated with Mike Campbell on the top five hit, Boys of Summer. Yeah, boys this is one of those stories behind a legendary song that is so incredible, you can scarcely believe that it's true. But it is, it's true. I'm so excited for you to see this now as we go into this interview about the Boys of Summer and Mike's new record, external combustion. I do want to thank our sponsor, Zenni Eyewear, my only choice for glasses. You know, with Zenni, it's really simple. If you need or want a new pair of glasses, you just go to zenni.com. You design your frames by size, shape, color, and then you add great additional features like blue blocks or anti-fog, anti-glare. Uh, you can even see how you look before you buy. You just put in your prescription, your address, and they'll deliver them right to your door, and it'll cost you less than a two-record set. Check it out today at zenny.com. Here is Mike Campbell. Hey, Professor. Nice to meet you. Yeah, good to meet you as well. One of the monumental songs of the 80s, Boys of Summer. Tell me about how that came together as you first started to record that. Well, I was making a demo. I had uh, Roger Lynn had given me a, the original Lynn drum, which pissed a lot of drummers off back in the day. But uh, I was playing around with that and got all the little hand claps and da da da's in it. Just one night, just goofing around. And then I also had borrowed Ben Mott's OBX synthesizer. And I, was, I came up with the chords on that to go with this drum beat. And then put some guitars on it. I had a the song basically the way it is except i had a different chorus and musically in the chorus when i showed it to tom it went to this weird minor chord which really did not lift up at all and uh, i remember jimmy and tom were listening to it and they go that's that part sounds kind of jazzy and i said yeah you're right so they passed on it and then i got the call from jimmy that don was looking for a song so i went back to that and i thought you know i'm just going to change these chords in the middle for the chorus and make it go into a major key You know, he just uh, was inspired by it and came up with that great song. Once again, there I was, the right place at the right time, you know. 
you said that when he, when Don listened to it, kind of put his head down, and uh, he didn't know for <laughs> <Yeah>. sure. <laughs> what he was he was like this. Didn't tap his foot, didn't nod his head, anything. I thought he hated it. And again, at the end, he goes, okay, thank you. And I left. And then he called me and said, oh, I think I got the best song I've ever written. I go, really? He said, let me hear it. You know, so that's the way he is. You know, he doesn't give it up. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> when he listened to it, uh, I mean, you guys immediately went in and recorded it, as I understand it. Uh, Don changed the key. Well, there's another example of the demo was just really good. And we had to recreate the demo, which is just always really hard to do. But we did it, the whole song, all the overdubs and everything. And then he came in and said, okay, I want to change the key. And I was like, oh, God, I got to do this all over again, you know. But he was right, because there was some timber in his voice in the higher key that really put some passion into it. So we... We kept working on it, changed the key, and we did all the instruments. And uh, it was really exciting when we went and mastered that song. Uh, and it almost didn't happen that the tape was peeling off at the mastering lab as it was going by. I said, stop! The tape is ruined, and they glued it back on and got it to go through. And so it was kind of a miracle that, it, that we were able to get that finished. And uh, we were just jumping up and down. And then we thought we had something good. <laughs> Well, there was another point before that where it almost didn't happen, right? The Linda Oh, yeah, during the uh, recreation of the demo, that stupid drum had a, back in the day, you would save your program onto a little cassette, which was kind of dodgy. And so I had my thing on there, and I went down to the studio, and Don and them were all there. And I pushed play, and it said, error. You know, poof, <laughs> gone in the air. You know, and it was pretty intricate arrangement. And I don't think I could have done it again, really. I mean, maybe I could have, but it would have been really incredibly hard. And I'm sitting out there by myself on the floor. Please, God, please load, please load. And finally, it went loaded. I said, "Okay, record this right now before it breaks." You know, <laughs> so we did get it to tape. The moment where you and Don were in the Porsche listening. To the- <laughs> Oh, well, you've done your homework. You're yeah. from the College of Musical Knowledge, aren't you? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, we like to go deep. Yeah, yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah, that's true. We ran off the road. We were listening to it on the way back to the studio and blasting away real loud. And he kind of ran off the road, blew up his stereo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Some of the stuff in the 80s, could sound a little outdated because of some of the, the production and everything like mm-hmm. that. That's a song that still sounds so fresh. Where he says, out on the road today, I saw a deadhead sticker on a Cadillac. Out on the road today, I saw a deadhead sticker on a Cadillac. What great imagery. Yeah. I think he wrote that. I think he told me he wrote that listening to the cassette while he was driving. So that's pro- I think he did see that as he was listening to the music and he just put it into the lyric. He's a genius, you know, and so is Tom. They're both genius writers. The hippie turning into the yuppie in a way, right? Yeah. That had yeah. stick around a Cadillac and, and leaving behind some of those lessons learned and everything. Years later, the Ataris covered it, and they changed the lyric to "Black Flag" for their generation. I yeah, thought that was kind of that was kind of cool. Yeah, "Boys of Summer" is a magical moment. I mean, I I don't know how that happened. We we you know captured some you know magic out of the air. A genie in a bottle came out that day, and we got a great. Uh, spiritual musical track and Don came through with a great vocal it holds up I'm really proud of that one and I knew it was good when uh, it came out the day it came out uh, KLOS played it three times in a row which they never do and I thought okay I think this was going to do okay (laughs) yeah it did it went to the top five I think there's a lot of luck involved in songs like that, you know. You can't plan that, you know. They just, magic happens when it happens for whatever reason. And if you're blessed to experience it, then you're lucky, you know. 
Yeah, lightning in a bottle, for sure. And also the time that you heard it with Tom in the car. I read a story how you were trying to change the station and every station was playing it. <laughs> yeah, he was gracious about it. I don't know what bugged him because we were in the studio mixing uh, Don't Come Around Here No More. Don't come around here no more. And we went out to the car, as you used to do back in the day, with a cassette to listen to the mix and different speakers. And we turned it on. And there is, I changed the channel. Oh, there it is. I changed the channel. He looked at me and he goes, you were really lucky with that one, weren't you? <laughs> God bless him. But I think he was proud of me, you know, and it gave me a lot of confidence. I always wonder, though, what it would have sounded like, what song it would have been had Tom cut it. Yeah, we'll never know. We'll never know. Uh, it would have been good, but it would have been way different. Well, all these years later, what are your final thoughts on Boys of Summer? Um, I'm just really proud of it. Every time I hear it on the radio, I feel so lucky that uh, it's lasted so long. And I think that song will last forever. Some songs will. They'll last forever, you know. And it was also financially very a good timing for me at the time. I, I was in some trouble, and that song pulled me out of it. So I'm very close to that song, and uh, I am really appreciative that I had a chance to do that. So let's get into the new album, Mike Campbell and the Dirty Knobs, External Combustion. I want to talk about uh, Wicked Mind, driving rocker, that jangly riff. With a rebel soul, got a wicked mind and a heart well, uh, I wrote that with the Dirty Knobs in mind, and the Dirty Knobs is my band. They're like a rock and roll boogie outfit you know and i knew that uh, something along those lines would track well with them this song was just um, a character going through his his uh his struggle in life to get through being chased by some nefarious entity of some sort And, you know, he's got his wicked mind with a heart of gold, you know. He's a, a likable uh, criminal, maybe. <laughs> yeah, I got my so it was just a, a quick write, um, mostly around uh, an excuse to play that guitar riff, you know. Got a da-da-da-da-da, da-da-da-da-da, which I know has got to be from somewhere else, but I haven't been able to place it yet. But those are usually the best riffs. It starts the record off in the right way. Yeah. I love the guitar solo and then the hand claps. And I love uh, Bridget Bardot. Very <laughs> uh, 50s country rockabilly flavored. Bridget Bardot, impossible to resist. Bridget Bardot is, is a, a little slice of humor and... Uh, it is a, a bluesy rockabilly a groove, which I love. After just one kid. And I, I had heard that groove on some Little Walter record or something somewhere in my past, and I always wanted to do something with that feel. Cheap Talk is one of my favorites from the album because it's got that mysterious opening. It's like psychedelic rock noir with a symphonic Beatles-esque mystique about it. Tell me about that one. It is rock noir. That was well, uh, well noticed by you. That one was uh, actually an old track that I completely forgot about. Um, I have a tape vault of all my analog tapes, which are up here in the cabinet. And uh, my engineer was going through all of them and trying to, to organize them. And that one popped up. And I completely forgot about it. But I thought, you know, that'll really fit this record. It's got a dark, uh, I don't know, almost like a, a, a secret agent uh, kind of spooky vibe to it. And those kind of chords in it. I know how you are. Thank you. It's a, it's, a, it's a heavy riff and a dark brooding kind of song. 
And it's like, it's not love, is it? It's just cheap talk. <laughs> <laughs> And the title track is so funky, bluesy. Tell me about that one and really about kind of the album overall coming together. I mean, you had a great first record with Reckless Abandon, and it feels like the albums are kind of flowing together. Tell me about that. Well, it's a guitar band, and uh, the title track, External Combustion, is kind of, I think it's inspired maybe by Led Zeppelin. Keep my nose close to the ground. It's got a, a riff, it's built around a riff, and um, I, you know, formed the, the words around this guitar riff, which is kind of heavier than what we normally play. But uh, that was another one that I dug up from the old vaults that I completely forgot about. But I thought, that's a cool riff. It'll fit this band. And so we finished it off. And uh, uh, George Draculius, our producer, has been very valuable, like you said, with finding uh, the right vibe, the types of songs that fit this band. Because I write all kinds of music. But this band is a specific type of rock band. And external combustion is a chance for them to really, you know, play. And it's got those weird time signatures in it and that heavy riff. And uh, it's just a riff song, really. All of these songs on this record just drive the point home that rock is very much still alive. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Good. <laughs> Make sure that you get Mike Campbell and the Dirty Knobs' new album, External Combustion. The link is right below. You're going to love this album. It's really great. Uh, make sure to leave us a comment about this song. What, are, what is your take on this song? What are your feelings on Don Henley's solo versus the Eagles? What are your feelings about the way Mike Campbell put this together? And tell me what you think about Mike Campbell and the Dirty Knobs' new album. It's really great. Rock and Roll is still alive. This album is, uh, is definitely proof that it is. If you like our content, make sure to subscribe below. We'd love to have you as part of our community. Make sure to get your tickets to Professor of Rock Live as well. Help us keep the music alive. That's what it's all about. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. Stay safe.